you're going to see it more going F to G. Okay, because the first scale they're going to learn is a B flat scale. All right, so with bassoon, the other big um, technical thing is what's called flicking or venting. The reason it's called flicking is because we're going to touch and release these octave keys. So venting or flicking acts just like the half hole. When you open the half hole, it acts like an octave key. That's what it's doing, is it's changing the register of the instrument. So these three flick keys are on the back side with the left hand thumb, okay? So this is the whisper key. This is the C sharp key you're only gonna use for C sharp. This very long one here, okay, is the A flick key. Then this one is used for B flat, B natural, and C. You don't flick C sharp above the static, you know, middle C sharp. Then this actually, if you have a fifth key, not all bassoons have this, that's the D flick key. Okay? So the, the flicking motion is you're going to, with your left hand thumb, you're going to go, you're going to touch it and release it. Okay? You can, you can hold it down, all right, to make sure it sort of comes out, but that's not the technique that we're going for here. Okay? We want that, that really touch and release thing. Um, I'm going to turn so that you can hopefully see this. But if not, you, you, you know, you saw the motion. So the way to do this, the way to teach it, is to play the low note. Flicking starts on A. Okay, one, two, three, one, two. Step one is to play the low note. Step two is to release the whisper key while keeping the low note going. Okay, it shouldn't change. really doesn't affect the sound okay the only thing that, that may change the sound slightly is if it, they let it move because they've released a thumb and the third step is to flick the key and release it while tonguing okay so watch it up early is to prepare it, touch the key and release it. You can do the same thing for B flat except flick the one above it. Yeah, I'm not getting the right one. Everybody sort of see the process? So again, the three step process for flicking. Flicking starts on A, okay, which is top line A in the bass clef. The notes that are flicked or vented are A, B flat, B natural, C, and D above the staff, if you have the flick key. Okay, if not, you'll have to figure out a, a different way to sort of do it, mainly with embouchure with air. So the three-step process, play the low note, okay, release the whisper key while holding the low note. The note should not change. You're, in essence, preparing the thumb to go to the flick key. And the third step is to flick the appropriate key, touch it and release it, when tonguing. So I would definitely teach this in conjunction with the articulation. But here's the rule, okay? Here's the rule, the rules and the exception for flicking. <clears throat> you should start with the basic premise that anytime you see one of those notes up there, that you have to vent it or flick it, okay? If you just start with that basic assumption, then that will help. And the two exceptions are when you're slurring, okay? So for instance, the test tune has an E flat, which is not a flick note, and then a B flat, all right? Then it has a C, B flat, and then an A flat, which we'll talk about later. Um, but the, C, the B flat, C, B flat is all under a slur, okay? So you have to flick the first B flat because it's tongued. So anytime you tongue one of those notes up there, you must flick it or vent it. But then you have a slur to the C and the B flat, the next B flat. Once you've flicked once, if you're slurring in that same register, you don't have to flick again, okay, until you leave that register and have to re-enter it. The other exception is if you are slurring to one of the flicked notes from a half hole note, slurring only. Okay, so let's think about the B flat scale. B flat, C, D, E flat, F, G, which is a half whole note. G is a half whole note, okay, with the whisper key. So if you slur from the G to the A, you don't have to flick because you're, you're already in an upper register 
and your voicing is going to be correct just because you're already up there. Okay. If you're tonguing the B flat scale, then you might have to tongue the A and the B flat and then tongue the A again on the way down. Because anytime you articulate, it becomes part of the fingering. Okay, that's a very important concept. If you ever start a bassoonist, you must incorporate this as part of the fingering. It's just super important. Okay? Um, I gave you a different fingering chart than the ones that are in the book. Actually, some people like the T3, R3, whatever. I don't care. I just gave you an option. Okay? The, other, the last thing I want you to know about the bassoon is that... It has, just like clarinet, has left and right. You know how the clarinet has uh, fingerings on the, on the right hand bottom and then you have all those side keys on the left? Left fingerings for certain notes and then right fingerings. The bassoon has front and back, okay? So these thumb keys down here on the bottom, uh, on the boot joint, F sharp and then A flat, the last two keys respectively. You also have, on the front, you have pinky keys, which are also F and A flat keys. So there are times, for instance, the chromatic scale, I'll say, you know, you need to play F sharp on the front, excuse me, on the back with your thumb because you're already on low F. It does, you can't roll to the F sharp key because there's no roller there. So that's inappropriate technique, sort of like B flat to B natural on the flute with the left hand thumb. Um, you can roll from F to A flat on the bottom because there's a roller there, like saxophone has a roller. So in the chromatic scale, you're going to play F sharp in the back, all right, and then you'll play A flat in the front, all right. So there's a front and back set of alternate fingerings uh, for the bassoon. The bassoon is really fun. Um, I love playing the low notes on the bassoon. It's terrific, and um, so. Uh, but those are the real big things. You know, if you can have them master uh, the embouchure, the posture, and the alignment is super important. If their reeds working and they can cover the holes, they'll do fine on bassoon. You know, it's not uh, an impossible task. Okay? All right. On to the even better of the double reeds, though, because, of course, I'm a little biased with the oboe. We've already covered reed stuff on oboe. All right? So that's good. Um, you know, making sure that the opening is good on the oboe reed, making sure it doesn't have any, any defects um, is also important. Okay? It's always a good idea. It should be a good example here. If you're going to lay the bassoon down in the case, if you have to go somewhere for a few minutes or whatever, at least to take the vocal out, all right, and then you can have it sort of laid down flat in the case, because the vocal is the most sensitive part. And don't forget your seat strap. Super important. All right. The oboe is easy to assemble. Piece of cake. Just remember, make sure... Use small twisting motions, all right, and um, make sure the the, gork, the corks are greased appropriately. Sometimes they have these little um, cork savers on them. Just take them off and leave them in the case. Bottom joint and the bell. If there is a key on the bell, make sure you push the button down on the bell to raise the bridge while assembling. Small twisting motions, okay, and then this bridge lines up here. The oboe has two bridges, one on each side, unlike clarinet. But there's no need to push anything down. You want to just make sure that it's lined up, okay, from the start, and then you're just going to do real small twisting motions, and you need to make sure and check both sides of the oboe for the bridge, okay? Um, in terms of instruments, with bassoon, um, Yamaha and Fox are the big two uh, brands for beginners. Uh, they both make different models. Uh, they have the higher-end models of Yamaha and Fox, and then they have the student instruments. They're pretty expensive. Uh, student model bassoons are at least $2,500, three grand. So know that if you're planning a high school budget, um, that they're not exactly cheap. Um, so, but you do want to have at least one good functioning bassoon. Uh, just like with oboe, if the instrument is out of shape or out of whack, it's really going to make their life very difficult. Um, I think we talked about the adjustment screws on the oboe already, but just remember, adjustment screws are on the middle of keys, and then the post screws at the end are fair game. If they come out, you can put those back in, but do not touch the adjustment screws unless you really know what you're doing. 
Um, even I don't mess with them very often. I know some real basic adjustments and I have a guide. Uh, there's some good oboe adjustment guides out there, but you can turn something a half a turn and screw up the entire instrument. So it's just you need to be really careful and know what you're doing. So working instrument is important for the oboe. Um, we talked about embouchure. You don't want to see a smiley embouchure with the oboe. You want to make sure it looks sort of forward, okay, and the corners forward. One of the things that you've got to remember with oboe is that the amount of reed changes the sound pretty dramatically. So a good rule of thumb is about half the bark, okay, is about what you want. It's not a very good read. So I'm going to play a little bit, I'm going to play a D, and you're going to hear me move the reed in and out of my mouth. And there's going to be a sweet spot where the tone is pure. The more reed you have in your mouth, the more spread it sounds. The less reed you have in your mouth, the more puny and flat it sounds. So here's the good sound again. Okay, so hear the difference? Yeah, I hope that it's coming across on the tape pretty well. I think a good rule of thumb is to start with about half of the bark in your mouth. Everybody's lips are a little different. People with big lips will look like they have more reed in their mouth, and that's okay. People with thinner lips, will you'll see more bark. All right, so thick lips, you're going to see less bark. Um, but if you have them start with half the reed, that's a good, good starting point. The other thing you do is do what I just did, and move the reed in and out of their mouth, and they'll hear the difference in the sound, um, and hopefully... They won't, um, they won't play with poor uh, reed position. If the reed is too open, it's going to sound really loud, like extreme duck-esque. I wonder where that reed is that I had trouble with. Oh, no, it's not wet anymore. Uh, I'll try that in just a second. But it's going to sound very ducky and very loud and like it doesn't respond right away. That may be because the reed is too open. If the sound is super puny, sort of like when I was playing on the end of the reed, then the reed may be too closed. And if it started that way, okay, but if the reed was open when they got it, then what are they doing? If they've closed down the center of the reed, they're biting in the center of their lips. So you have to do something to get them looser. Uh, the pillow analogy works really well. You know, like the reed is resting on a pillow in the center of your lips. Okay, the firmness is definitely in the corners. All right, so out of tune, of course, that's probably a reed thing, as I mentioned. Uh, in terms of hand position with the oboe, uh, there's obviously a thumb rest for the right hand. Uh, and It's pretty natural. The right hand is pretty natural for the most part. The left hand is where you really have to concentrate on the oboe. The, the thumb, the left hand thumb is going to be 45 degrees, sort of like the clarinet, depending on if they have a hitchhiker thumb or not. Then index three, four. What I would love for all of you to do if you teach the oboe, it would save me lots and lots of anguish for my students when they get to me. If you could have them curve their ring finger in their left hand, okay? Most of most oboists, myself included some of the time, play with a straight ring finger. So you want to avoid that. If you have a real natural curve to your left hand, bring your palm close to the instrument. Don't have your palm away from it and your left arm really tucked into the body, it actually helps, okay, with the, with the hand position. It will also give you a natural curve for your index finger, which is what we need for the half hole on the oboe, okay? So the left hand ring finger is almost always the culprit. It's almost always the culprit on bassoon, too, by the way. If you can't get a note out, if you hear them struggling getting a note out, have them check the left hand index finger, and I, or the ring finger, rather, the ring finger. I bet it's not covering the holes, okay? And the oboe has very small holes, so it's actually easier than the clarinet that way. Uh, the holes aren't as big to cover. But if there's an issue, it's going to be with the left hand ring finger. Okay, so half hole on the on the oboe. Um, I am going to go over this one more time in class just to put the notes on the board. But the, the three half hole notes on the on the oboe are uh, C sharp, so that would be fourth space C sharp treble clef, fourth line D and D sharp or E flat, okay, top space, E flat. Those are the three half hole notes on the, on the oboe. 
The way you teach the oboe half hole is exactly like I taught you with the bassoon. Have them walk down to the low D from like a B natural first finger. That's great. You know, if they can get down there and get that note out, then they're covering the holes, air and embouchure working, that's awesome. Then tell them to rock their in left hand index finger away or roll it down. Use the words rock, pivot, roll, do not slide, okay? You'll see it if they're sliding and you really need to make sure you correct that right away. So get to the low note successfully first, then have them uh, rock the index finger away or down. I'll get a little closer. working good today. All right, so that's um, the motion of the half hole. Again, like bassoon, like clarinet, like saxophone, every instrument has a break on it, okay, every woodwind instrument, where you go from no fingers to all the fingers and you're changing register. Technically, the break on the oboe is between C and C sharp, uh, but the, where you're going to encounter it, and very quickly, because the first three notes in the band books are B flat, C, and D. And the third note that they learn, D, they're going to have to deal with the half hole, okay? So really important to get them going down to the low D, getting the holes covered and all that kind of stuff before they start having to go one and one C, D, okay? <laughs> having that motion is a good and really important thing, okay? Keep your fingers close to the keys when not playing and it'll, you'll have an easy time with it. So you want as little motion as possible, all right? One of the best exercises you can have them do is uh, like an octave exercise, where you start on D, you can do it from D sharp or C sharp, and then have them walk down or up. steal them to you. Um, but that will really get them going with the motion uh, for the half hole. It's got to be open enough. You'll hear it if it's not open enough because it cracks. All right. But you want as little motion as possible to accomplish your goal. You don't want to go You don't want to have them moving their arm. Their arm should be stationary. It's just the finger that should be moving. Okay. All right, so off to the Fs. There are three, technically there are three fingerings for F on the oboe, on full conservatory oboes, okay? Um, most oboes will not have a little uh, extra key over here. You're actually probably gonna have one, two keys, because you're not gonna have the low B flat key either. Let me get up closer, okay? So this is actually the low B flat key right here. All right, this is actually a left-hand F key. So if they do have a full conservatory instrument, meaning they have all the whole, all the keys, then they'll have three, a choice of three Fs. But beginner oboes have two, okay? Regular F and forked F, like a fork. Um, and the reason they call it forked is because you only use the index finger and the ring finger. Sorry, I'm not flipping you guys off over there. <coughs> but it looks like a fork, okay? And that's why that fingering is um, used. So the first thing your oboe students should do when they get a new piece of music is to mark in their Fs. If it's a regular F, I don't mark it. But if it's forked or left, I always mark it. To this day, the first thing I do when I get a new piece of music is I mark the F fingerings. If there are any left or forked Fs, I mark them in my music with a little F or a little L. Okay? Some people actually use the fork symbol, which is fine. Um, whatever your kids want to do. So here's the rule. And like, I'm gonna go over the half hole on this one more, just so you can see the notes on the board. But as I've gone over in class, if the note before or immediately after an F has the right hand ring finger, okay? So if it uses the right hand ring finger, then you must use forked F, okay?
Okay, I'll say it again. If the note right before or right after an F uses the right hand ring finger, then you must use forked F. Okay, left F is a whole different story. Okay, because uh, you would use left F in those instances instead of forked F. The difference would be is if you're using, if you're playing anything in four flats or higher, then you would want to use the forked F. The reason I don't like forked F, hopefully it'll sound different on the tape, on the tape. You want to avoid forked F if you can, because it just sounds gross. So here's regular F. Left F sounds exactly like regular F. Now here's forked F. I'll play regular F first, and then I'll play forked F. flat key is really flat but more stable listen I'll play this time I'll play regular F and then I'll play forked F with the E flat key okay when you use the E flat key it makes it so sharp and just gross so as a general rule when I play forked F I do not use the E flat key it makes sense to use it because you're usually coming from an E flat when you go to forked F. The half whole notes obviously use the right hand ring figure. So if you have a half whole note right before an F, you're going to have to go to forked F. But I would teach it without the E flat key. Okay, I think it's just a little more stable that way. All right, I hope there's no questions on that. I will go over that one more time. Um, the other big thing with the oboe um, are breathing and the second octave key. Um, there are actually my oboe has three octave keys. The lower one is the regular octave key. This one is the uh, second octave key, or excuse me, the third octave key. Most oboes don't have that unless it's a professional horn. Then this key right here on the side is called the second octave key or the side octave key. Okay? So the side octave key or the second octave key comes on when you get to high A natural above the staff. Okay? A natural, B flat, B natural, B, uh, C. Okay? Anything higher than C, you're going to start to get into some forked fingerings and so forth, and the altissimo. So the second octave key comes on on high A. Okay? Here's a, this is really important. All right, I'm going to look directly in the camera and say this is really important. In your fingering chart on D2L, I colored in the back octave key. Because most fingering charts for beginning OBA students, when you get to the high A, it tells you to lift the back octave key and just put the side octave key on. Having the back octave key on makes absolutely no difference to the tone, okay, when using the second octave key. So you should always use the, the back octave key or the first octave key when you're using the second octave key. Use them both, okay, A and higher. Now, um, obviously you can't use on a G or an F, you can't use the second octave key. You wouldn't want to do that. That wouldn't make any sense. But when you're playing the second octave key, make sure you have the back octave key on. And I'm going to show you why, okay? Um, let me get closer. So this is the second octave key. I'm going to play it first without the back octave key on. For, and then it's hard to hold, too. It makes no difference to the tone. Okay, when you put the back octave key on, what if you had to go A to G really fast? A has the second octave key, G is only the back octave key. Watch, if you didn't have the back octave key on for A, look how hard this would be. Why not just go Doesn't that look a heck of a lot easier? It makes no sense technique wise to not use the back octave key. If it was changing the tone or something, I could certainly understand uh, the rationale. It makes absolutely no difference to the tone. So very, very important. When you're using the second octave key, make sure that if you're using a band book or you need to explain to them if they found an internet fingering chart, it's not going to be on there. It's going to be a very difficult habit to break um, if they don't remember this from the very beginning when they start using that second octave. I, I usually like to do this uh, exercise in class, but you can try it while you're watching the video. <coughs> the oboe has an extremely small hole, okay? So, you know, I can sit here and play a D natural. I can hold it for 30 seconds. 
That's how long of a phrase I could play or long of a note I could play because the hole is so small and so little air is getting in at one time. Okay, so um, the important thing to remember in terms of breathing with the oboe is that you must use up all the oxygen into your lungs, expel all the carbon dioxide because if there's, if there's still air in there, it's going to turn to carbon dioxide, of course, and then that's going to not allow you to take a full breath. So what I always do with kids is I have them take a breath and then take two more on top of it. Eventually, your lungs can't expand any further. Okay, You've taken in all the air. Oba players, when they do not use up all their air or exhale any stale air, that's how you start to feel. You get what we call stacked up. Um, the air gets stacked up in your lungs. And um, so the, the, the threefold strategy for this, and sometimes you have to write it in your music, all right? Use up every bit of air that you take in, okay? So if you take a full breath, you better be playing it and using it all up so that before your next breath, you are empty. If for some reason you can't do that, then you must exhale before you inhale again, all right? So there are times where you're playing four bar phrases that I might mark in my part out, and I don't even take a breath. I just exhale some stale air, play a few more fra I play a few more measures. Then when I finally breathe, it feels so good. You know, you've got fresh oxygen coming into your lungs. The third approach is to only take in the amount of air that you need to play the phrase. Okay, so you don't necessarily a tuba player is going to tank up every single time they play a note. They're going to just fill fill it up with air. But oboe players don't necessarily need to do that. Okay, this is a more advanced concept, I think, than um, exhale or use it all up. Um, but only take in the amount of air that you need to play a phrase. Okay, so if you know you've got some little chunks of, of music and you might start to go and start to stack up, you might not take in as big of a breath when you start the piece or whatever, or when you start a, a section of a piece. So um, that's super important. Don't stack up when you're playing the oboe. Okay, there is. <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, sort of a question on this test that uh, is going to test sort of your knowledge of um, if you had to switch a student from an instrument, what would you switch them from and why? Uh, and why would you not switch a student from a particular instrument? So be thinking about that. Um, I hope you have a good week um, or whenever you watch this video. And I will see you guys on Monday, December 3rd.